inculturation is the process of building in responsivity and ultimately responsibility, the ability to respond to a particular call. And we then have appropriately enculturated ourselves when we can respond to our own culture and to our own values and to our own needs. One other thing here then, as we rapidly bring these things to a close, we have to look at personality in this light as well. We think our personality is ours. You must recognize, ladies and gentlemen, that the human being is a social animal. We exist in society. We exist in groups. We are born dependent, not independent. We have long periods of dependency. And it is the social relationship between ourselves and our mothers and ourselves and our group that protects us during our long periods of dependency. And in a sense, we never quite get over our dependency and need for one another. And so consequently, we are social animals and we must then respond to social situations. Our personalities, because they may be our personality, does not mean that they are not inculcated with a social spirit and they are not designed for a social end. In other words, the individual exists for the social unit, not for himself. We see individuality as something that, that, that is just for ourselves. Why are we individuals? We are individuals to a great extent because when our culture and our group confronts problems, we want to maximize the possibility that we will solve those problems by the fact that different individuals look at those problems in different ways and they can contribute their particular perspective to the group and those perspectives can be used as a means for solving the problem for the group. So even individuals are there to strengthen the group. You see, if all the people in the society thought just alike and saw the world just alike, they thought no differently one from the other the society would be soon defeated because it would be uncreative. It would, be un, it would not be innovative. It would not be able to change its perspective of a problem in a way so that it can solve it. So what does it do then? It creates individuals. It's like the reasons why we have genetic variations. We say no matter how uh, intense a plague may be in a nation or a people, there are always one or two people left standing because in some way or another their genetic uh, structure has permitted them to withstand the plague. And as long as we got a few of those survivors left and as long as they can reproduce, the race continues and goes on. But if the race had all exactly the same genetic structure, then a plague would wipe out the total race and the species would cease to exist. And the same thing then operates in terms of differences in personalities. We differ in personality ultimately because these differences contribute to the survival of the species. And therefore our differences are here to maintain the whole. So the main problem of a society is to maintain enough cohesion so people can act together and behave together and act in synchrony one with the other and cooperate with each other but not be too overly organized so that they cannot bring their own creative perspectives to problems and issues. You see, and this becomes the problem of society. So there must always be that tension between uh, being in the society and obeying its rules but being a little bit off so that we can say, hey, maybe if you look at it this way, we can work it out and we can deal with it this way. So the personality itself must carry the element of society within itself. But the thing we must note, that personality, consciousness, and culture are cultural creations. 
and the type of culture that people exhibit and the type of consciousness we exhibit and the type of personality we exhibit reflects the type of history and experience we've undergone as people. When you let another people then be the determiner of your history and experience, they then become the determiners of your consciousness, of your personality, and of your culture. Ultimately, we must recognize that we use consciousness to deal with the world. Culture is an adaptative tool. It's an instrument by which we deal with reality, by which we adapt to reality, and by which we adapt reality to ourselves. The kind of consciousness we have will determine how we deal with reality. Consciousness then will, in the fact that it determines how we are going to deal with reality, how we change reality, then is a power. Because ultimately, uh, power is about enabling something to take place. The ability to do something. The ability to change something. The ability to adapt. The ability to defend oneself. The ability to change oneself in order to solve a problem. This is what culture is about. Culture is not static. Culture is not stuck in one place. Culture itself must reconstruct itself if the system in which it exists is reconstructed and rearranged. That is why some of us get in trouble because we want to find an African culture stuck somewhere back in the 13th century and want to apply it to ourselves at this point in a different context. African culture is not a culture stuck in place and time. African culture is constantly changing and evolving because the context in which African people live changes and evolves. What makes it African culture is that it operates in the interest of African people. It is designed to advance African people and therefore the consciousness must be measured in terms of the degree to which it maintains our survival and advances our interests and puts us at the center of our concerns and at the center of our purposes. When then we talk about black culture, make sure we're not talking about a reactionary culture, a culture that has been generated by our reaction to our abuse by white folk and to our control and domination of white folk. Because it's a good part of what we call black culture that we need to exorcise from our psyches so that we can evolve a, a culture and an African centered culture to advance our interests as a people. We, another very important aspect then of consciousness is what we call values. Those things that we prefer, those things that we see as right, those things that we think we should, we should need, those things the pursuit of which determines our behavior, organizes our mind. Uh, values are what I call di the directional factors of consciousness. What are we talking about here? When you value something, and that value is implanted in your brain, the brain calls forth all of its resources, all of the contents that it has, the knowledge it has available to it, the behavioral skills it has available to it, the cognitive skills, the thinking skills and things like that that it has available to it and organizes those things and relates those things one to each other in such a way that the value can be achieved. When we then think about something that we value and we want to realize something that we value, we consciously or unconsciously assess our minds and say, do I have the relevant knowledge? Do I have the relevant skills? Do I have the relevant thinking and cognitive skills so that we can organize these knowledge and skills in a way that we can achieve those values? If we believe we have those skills, if we believe we have the content, if we appropriately organize those contents through thought, then we pursue those values. And chances are we may realize those values. 
If though we have those values and we assess ourselves, we recognize that we don't have the appropriate skills, we don't have the appropriate knowledge and content, we don't have the appropriate thought styles and so forth, we then say, well, maybe we should develop the requisite skills. Maybe we should learn the requisite knowledge. Maybe we should develop the means of thinking. And once we do this, we will then organize them away in a way to achieve our values. Once we then have values and are guided by values, and those values guide those skills and contents and so forth, we are empowered to realize those values. And therefore, values are a type of power. Where am I going with this? I'm going with this to say this. If values are a type of power, if values are the things that guide our behavior, if culture is a type of power, and consciousness is a type of power, and personality is a type of power, if we let another people determine the nature of our consciousness, our personality, and our values, they then gain power over us. If consciousness, culture, personality, and values are instruments of power, they then use our consciousness, our values, our culture as their instruments of power. How does this work out in reality? They take our cultural products, our music, our song, and use them as their instruments of power. Yes, and benefit from them. So then, what is an African-centered consciousness? An African-centered consciousness is one that is based on African-centered content, based on African-centered knowledge, based on African-centered values, based on an African-centered consciousness. To the degree that our consciousness is based on African-centered values and so forth, we are empowered as African people. To the degree those values and consciousness are determined by other people, we become their instruments of power and they use us against ourselves. So consequently, if we are to be empowered and if our power is to work in our interests, then our consciousness must be an African consciousness. Our values must be African values. Our personality must be an African-based personality. If not, we may suffer. First, ethnocide and then genocide. What are we saying? It means that our culture will not be functional in a way that it protects our interests. We must then, as a people, develop a new African consciousness, a, an African-centered consciousness, and that means we must develop it based on an African history, African culture, and African values. Most of all, we must develop an African sense of nationhood. <laughs> to a great extent, many of the problems we suffer today is a result of the fact that we do not see ourselves as a nation. And yet, we complain about how we are segregated from everybody else. We complain about how we are not a part of the mainstream, how we are not a part of the economy, how we are shut out from the government and the political process. If we are not a part of these things, and yet these things are what defines a nation, then we are not a part of the American nation. That nation is a white nation. We are then, in effect, a de facto nation, but we are afraid to recognize it. If we looked at ourselves as a nation, we'd see many of the reasons why we are where we are as a people. Why? Because if we looked at ourselves as a nation, we would see why we have the problems we have. Why do we have some of the problems we have? For the same reason other African nations have the problems they have. Why? Because we permit our resources, human resources and material resources to be used by another people. We export them. 
We, like any other African nation, are an indebted nation. We are over indebted. When we talk about the African nation suffering from over, overburdened, uh, being overburdened by debt, we don't recognize we're talking about ourselves. When I ask here tonight, how many of us owes another black institution, another black person major debt, we would get very few hands. But if I ask how many of us in this audience tonight owed a white person, a white institution, a non-African institution, great debt, we probably all had to raise our hands. If you recognize that then, and you add this up in terms of a nation, not if you, just to yourself as an individual, but if you look at all of us as individuals and in terms of a nation, then that as a nation, we owe an enormous debt to other people. And one of the reasons why then we are poverty stricken is not because we don't have money, it's because all of our money is being used to service the debt that other nations own, that the white nation in America owns. And because we spend so much time paying our installment plans and paying our money out to these other nations of people, we cannot save our monies, we cannot accumulate our money and create wealth so that we can employ ourselves as a people, so that we can support our families as a people, so that we cannot build the schools we need to build to educate our children the way we need to educate them as a people. And consequently, we have the similar problems that all African nations have almost, where they cannot build highways, or build schools, or build hospitals, or build institutions, communication systems, and other systems, because all of the wealth that they are generating is being exported out to European nations and other nations to whom they owe debt. But you can only see this when you look at yourself as a nation. And when you look at yourself as a nation, then you can see that you can change this problem by changing the debt relationship you have to other people. I was looking at an issue here the other day when we were talking about looking at African nations and we talk about the African nations as monocultures, meaning that they often exist by shipping out one or two major products cocoa or cocoa beans or, or uh, oil or gold or something like that. And they ship these products out into what we call a buyer's market. That is, the people they sell these products to set the prices that they're going to pay for these products. So that many of these nations now are being paid less for their products than they were paid 30 years ago. And yet, the nations that buy their products and lower the prices on their products, are selling them back those products in process form, and selling them back their own products that have been manufactured here for higher and higher prices. And then we wonder why Africa is in debt and why Africa is impoverished. But that is the result of the fact that they are caught up in an impoverishing mechanism. But we need not talk about the continental African because we are in the same situation here today. African, the African American nation is a monoculture. What is the commodity that we sell? Labor. We're not selling much manufacturing. We're not selling much other products. The major commodity that we have to sell was the commodity that we were bought over here for in the first place. And what was that? Labor. And now we are selling our labor in a buyer's market, meaning that the people who buy our labor are buying it at the prices they set. And they keep devaluing the price that they are willing to pay for our labor. On top of devaluing the price, they are no longer even demanding the labor. So after a while, we won't be able to sell our labor at any price. And we will then be totally deprived as a people. And therefore, we are caught in a similar position. And just as there's social disorganization in our African nations, there's social disorganization in the American nation. You cannot have your wealth flowing out of your nation. You cannot enrich other people at the expense of yourself and not have social disorganization. And that means then, if we look at ourselves as a nation, 
The African-American nation must do what all African nations must do. We must capture our own internal resources. We must gain control of our own internal markets. We must trade within ourselves as a people and a group and generate wealth within our own nation as a means of counterbalancing our dependence upon Europeans and upon the white nation itself. But in order to do this, we must have a nation consciousness. We must now organize and relate to ourselves as a nation of people. When we look at our relationship, we say to the Koreans as a nation, we see the same relationship that Japan has to America as a nation. You notice that they are bargaining right now, negotiating, right? Japan is building up its resources. It is blocking out U.S. industry from its nation, yet it is entering into the American markets and selling there and taking out the wealth of the American markets. If we look at our relationship to Koreans, to Dominicans, to other groups, we'll see the same relationship where those groups can enter into the African-American nation, set up shop, ship out its wealth day by day and night by night, and yet the African-American entrepreneurial nation is not permitted to set up shop in their midst, is not permitted to carry wealth from their, from their nations. And they then grow fat on the surplus that they gain from the African-American nation. This means then that if we think of ourselves as a nation, we must protect our internal markets from the intrusion of outsiders. We must not permit them entry into our nation. As I look and I see down the 125th streets, yes, and look at our people locked outside there in the outside, and some people claim that they are protesting this kind of thing. I agree with our vendors there that if black men and black women cannot make a living on that street, then no other people should be permitted to make a living on that street. We are not obligated in any kind of way to feed the, the children of other people before we feed our own. But it's only if you think in terms of nationhood that you can resolve this kind of problem. We have tremendous possibilities as a black nation that we don't know where. You can see these white boys over there pursuing China, don't you? Right? They're over to China knocking over each other to get to it. What is the China market worth? to the European. You know what the China market is worth to the European? $500 billion at this point. Do you know what the black market is worth to the European here in America? $400 billion. Our market is as much worth as much as the Chinese market, the Mexican market, which they've drawn up to, to bring in NAFTA. It is worth as much and is worth more than the market of Canada. We are not able to place conditions on their entry into our markets by saying if you enter here, you are going to pay taxes. If you enter here, you are going to leave something here. If you enter here, you are going to leave money in the institutions. You are going to contribute to our schools. You're going to contribute to our recreational centers. You're going to contribute to the employment of our people and to the stability of our families. If you cannot contribute to these things, if you cannot create jobs, if you cannot contribute to the education of our people, then we cannot permit you to operate within our borders. This is the way a nation runs. You don't let another people walk in and have their way and walk out and leave you impoverished as a people in the name of a free market. There's no such thing as a free market. Yeah, that's white folks' propaganda. Free and open market. No free market. They force people into their market. Castro was not free to say, I don't want to be a part of it. When he said, I don't want to be a part of it, they did what? Embargoed him and locked him out. The, China, the Japanese in the early uh, part of the century said, we don't want to be a part of your market. 
What did the United States do? Sent Admiral Perry in there and blasted those markets open. What free markets do you have there? There are no such things as free markets. And when you learn that, you're going you, you, you're to be the better for it. And we got the markets, but we are not taking advantage of them. We have gotten ourselves in a situation where we are locked out of other people's markets and we permit them into our own such that we are locked out of our own markets. And then we wonder why we suffer the way we do. It is not because we are poor. If we were that poor and impoverished, then why do those people come to us to earn their living and their wealth? It means then we must be a wealthy people. I was looking over here at a recent report. You see, we have as a people everything that it needs to make a nation. We have telephones, fax machines, computers, highways, bridges, riverways, waterways, trucks, everything that many nations in the world, in fact, the vast majority of nations in the world, wish that they had available to them what the African-American nation has available to it. They wish they had the highways. They wish they had the trucks. They wish they had the trains. They wish they had the ships. They wish they had the computers, the telephones, and all of those kinds of things that you can just pick up and dial right away, and they don't have to be rooted through France or somewhere else. The lights don't go off at 2 o'clock every day or just flip on and off. You got it all here. Then why then are we not better off than we are? Because it is not enough, as I told you earlier, it is not enough to have gold in your soil or oil in your soil or diamonds in your soil. You must have a consciousness. It is only with an appropriate consciousness that these things can be transformed and converted into what? Wealth and power and can be used for the advancement of a people and the survival of a people. The same is true here then. You cannot just have telephones and taxes and this and that and not just have money in your pocket. That's not enough. You must have a consciousness that transforms those phones and transforms those faxes into a communications network that unites a people across regions and places and cities and becomes a basis for a system of distribution, a basis for uniting and creating a market from which one earns wealth to feed one's family and to stabilize one's social situation. But you can have all of these things, but if you don't have a sense of nation, if you don't have a group consciousness, if you do not identify yourself as a nation, then these are but so many instruments and becomes, as a matter of fact, the means by which we destroy ourselves. We are looking at the black, uh, black buying power in America here, 1990 to 95. We got a report here called the Georgia Business and Economic Conditions published here by the Selick Center at the University of Georgia, titled Black Buying Power by Place of Residence, 1990 uh, to 95. The second of a two-part analysis of buying power in specific markets. What are we talking about here? Is this published for us? No. no. What it's published for is for white folk, right. and it's telling them how much money black folk got. And it's telling them that the, black, the money black folk got is the difference between their success and their failure. It reads in part here, Georgia's African-American uh, population thus controls approximately 16 cents of each dollar in spending power. That is about one dollar, uh, that is about one dollar in six is spent by black consumers. How aware are we of the kind of power? we have as African people. Right. Clearly, they are a substantial economic force throughout the state. Uh. All right. But without a nation of consciousness, you don't recognize that. Right. But they recognize it. All they right. go on to say, for many of Georgia's businesses, the ability to capture black spending can make the difference between success and failure. They're putting it right in your face. If black spending power, if black spending 
can make the difference between the success and failure of Georgia businesses, and we're talking about what? White folks' businesses. That means black folk got what? Power. Because power is about what? The ability to succeed or to bring about what? Failure. And when somebody else's success or failure depends on your own behavior, then you have what? Power. New York State, the largest black market in the world, the largest black market in the world and the largest black market in this country. How much money are we worth in New York State, black people? You know how much money we are worth? $61 billion. That is a lot of money. This represents well over 10% of the buying power in New York State alone. I'm speaking of the, the, the area, the New York, Connecticut, tri-state area. And uh, what does that mean? Now, but don't look at that absolute figure. Look at what would happen if we reinvested that $60 billion. If we put that $60 billion in black businesses, in black trade, if we invested that $60 billion in gaining equity in the major American corporations, if we gain that, use that $60 billion to gain equity in African countries. You know, I was just reading a piece this week about the fact that black investment bankers, a couple of black investment bankers, are selling as much as $100 million of bonds for the, the African uh, Development Bank. Yes, another black investment banker is selling something like $500 million of securities for African businesses and infrastructural development. What does that mean, African people? That means that if we were knowledgeable of corporate finance, if we were knowledgeable of investment vehicles, we could literally finance the development of Africa. And by buying securities in the African Development Bank, by buying bonds, by buying other investment instruments in African corporations, even if they're owned by white folks, because once we buy the shares, we become the owners. In other words, then, by using black wealth, we can become the vehicle for financing African growth and development. And by, by using our own wealth and financing our own businesses, developing our own economic system, we would multiply our wealth, and we would not only be then worth $400 billion, we'd be worth uh, $800 billion or more and we would go stronger. And the stronger we go, grow, the more others would depend upon how we spend in order to survive. And to that degree, we will gain power over them. If tomorrow we decided as African people to build co-op supermarkets across this country, and we can do it, so that we can sell our people grocery and food at below wholesale prices, if we decided, using our church organizations as a means for sponsoring these co-op uh, food markets across the country so that we can open them literally simultaneously, and centered then the buying uh, power for all of those co-op centers in a way that then we would have billions of dollars to spend with the suppliers of food, we could then manipulate those producers in terms of the buying power that we have. We can begin then to place our people on their boards. We can begin then to have real and substantial power right. in America. We have it in our hands, but you gotta think of it as nation. Right. It becomes interesting, by the way, if you study this particular breakdown of black spending in Georgia, and I wish we would get these breakdowns across the country. You see, when you become a state and a nation, you develop statistics. All right. Thank you. you see? And that's where statistics come from. Right. It is the means by which a state and a nation gathers information about itself so that it can use that information to reorganize itself and to set itself up in ways to advance its interests. 
So once you become a nation, you become sensitive to the fact that you need a lot of information so that you can use this information. Now, when I read about the percentage of black buying power in Georgia by counties, something becomes very surprising. You note, for instance, that black buying power is as high as 25 and 26 percent in many of these counties. For instance, in Liberty County, Georgia, black buying power there uh, is a is 22 percent of the total buying power. In Mer uh, in Merkweather, 25 percent. Peach County, 25 percent. Uh, and you can just go on and on. In some of these counties, black buying power is as much as 45 percent, 35 percent. In other words, the black consumer has these counties by the balls. And they are able, if that buying power was to be coordinated and used, to have real impact and to transform the power relations of those societies and of those counties. They would be able, if they are buying half or 25 percent or 30 percent of what is being bought in those counties, to establish their own businesses and enterprises there. And they would be able to defend those businesses and enterprises through the use of the boycott weapon. So what are we saying here then this evening, ladies and gentlemen? That African power is based on an African consciousness based on an African-centered culture, based on an African-centered personality. And the degree to which our personalities and our culture are based on African values, based on African interests, based on African goals, to that degree we empower ourselves as Africans, and to that degree we escape the power of others over us.